Hello CIS40A. In this video we're going to talk about Unit 6 and I'm sorry for posting this a little later than usual. Um, so in this chapter we're going to touch on the utility for TCP IP um, and some of the ones we've been using all along since week one in our lab and our assignments. So in this week we're also going to go over your assignment um, as you watch this video, it's best to open the notes and your assignment and follow along. So in chapter six, it touches on different utilities starting with ARP. And in the lab, we play with this a little bit. Um, ARP is used to display and modify the cache um, of ARP. And ARP mainly is your address resolution protocol. It ties the IP address to the MAC. Um, and so we want to be able to resolve the MAC address to the IP so that way it can get your data routed and also be able to bring your data back to the exact system in certain part of the network. So it's play a very important role. Um, and then we use IP config in command prompt or you would see the old Linux IF config or IP address in the, the newer, uh, that will be the newer command. And this allows you to display your IP configuration or your system IP configuration. Then ping is to use to verify host name, IP address, and overall connectivity. This is a very important tool. Um, however, sometimes certain network will block ping as it would um, create issues, um, especially with certain type of attack. Trace route is a way that we can follow the packets um, from one network to the next by looking at which router that data is being passed to um, and those are considered hops so trace route is very important so in the case where you're troubleshooting you wanted to um, see if you know if your network is having bottleneck issues or um, it's able to route or there's a delay in the route or certain routers are going to be able to um, forward the packet or be able to pass the packet, we can also use traceroute. Um, then NetStat gives us statistics for TCP IP connections. And then FTP allows us to download and upload for file between remote systems. And then MBT stat is a way to troubleshoot NetBIOS over TCP IP connections. So here, what we see is various utility tool. I think we touch on all of these so far. Um, but for the Network Plus, make sure that you understand what these protocols do, um, how they're used, and the command that we're using them with for Windows and some Linux. Okay, so. We talked about address resolution protocol, which is ARP. It's designed to map the logical IP address to the MAC address. And this is a way that in, in order for the system to quickly transfer, um, you know, or map IP to MAC, it would store the information that it previously um, established. So it stored that into a cache, which is a temporary memory. Um, of the of the system. So then if that same connection is needed again, it would then go to that temporary location and be able to check the information so that way it would um, it would then use that for for fast connectivity. Now, sometime cache uh, for the ARP would go stale in that it's no longer used um, or it would be unavailable. So there are four types of ARP messages. We have the request, the reply, the request, and the reply again with ARP. So the first two are ARP, and the second are uh, the second sets are RARP. And here uh, we can see that ARP cache we can um, manually set it, and I think you saw this when we did the lab where you can use the, the option S to be able to um, put in the IP and the MAC. And then you can also use the dynamic entry, which is stored by the system naturally when it is 
uh, establishing that connection. So uh, our cash uh, does have an age and it is about the lifetime of it is about two minutes in the window system. It would then, if you want to look at the parameter for the ARP, you can go to the path for the HP local machine and window systems. Um, so the entry are often reused within two minutes um, and then they stay on for about 10 minutes. And then if they're reused again, then it will just be, uh, it will just be fresh and be reused. But if it's not being reused over a certain period of time, over the 10 minute span, it becomes stale. So then you would see that ARP cache is, there's also an expiration in it. Um, so by default, the lifetime is 120 seconds or two minutes to be used. And you can look at the registry information in Windows to look at the setting for that. Now, ROP is the reverse ARP. It's used to translate MAC addresses to IP. The utility is about the same as the Windows as it is in Linux. Um, and so it is the opposite. So if we need to translate MAC address to IP, we use reverse ARP. If we, if we go from IP to MAC address, we would use ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. So now um, this allows the server to contain mapping from, IP, uh, from MAC to IP, so that way it would know exactly which machine to be able to respond to. And it's primarily used in such that there's certain system that will be disk list or um, the machine that doesn't have the actual hard disk, like the thin client in the network. So for the first few questions, we can go through and answer these. Um, for the question number one, it asks you to identify the utility based on the following scenario. Jessica wants to display and modify ARP cache in the system, what utilities should she use? We would use ARP, but specifically if you're looking at the command, she would then use ARP-A in Windows command prompt, or we can use ARP-S to set ARP cache. For B, the network administrator wants to gather the statistic of the system current TCP IP connections, what utilities should the network administrator use? That will be netstat. And the keyword here is gather statistic. So that will be netstat. And it does require a little bit of time to be able to provide the statistic of the connection. Um, and however, we want to be able to look at the statistic to make sure that we check our for network throughput or any kind of issues that we might come across in uh, network connection. Then C, Jose is trying to verify host IP and physical connection of his computer. What utility should he use? He can ping the address, uh, the IP address, or he can ping the loopback address. That would, uh, if he pings the IP address of that system, it would then see, send out four packets to itself. And if that system is connected, it would reply. If it doesn't reply, if it shows that all the packets are lost and it's not an unreachable, then we would know that the physical system of that, that's the physical connection of that system is malfunctioning. The loopback address is basically referring to the system itself. So we, instead of using the actual IP address, we can use the 127.0.0.1 which is then going to ping back to the local system, which is the same system. Then a D, a technician is um, need to troubleshoot the conflict of NetBIOS to system in the network. What utility should the technician use? That will be NBT stat um, and host name. So we can take a look at the actual system name and also the NetBio statistic there. Um, so we can troubleshoot if there's conflict in name for, mul for multiple computers. That means that the computer can be assigned the same name um, in the network. 
E, Christina is looking to connect remotely to systems terminal for troubleshooting. Which utility should Christina use? And that will be Telnet. Um, Telnet is unsecured. We, I don't recommend using Telnet. You should use SSH instead. Or in Windows environment, you can also use RDP. However, Telnet is an older technology. It's still there. Uh, but it's used on an older system. It has weak security. Um, and so for Windows, we would use RDP, which is Remote Desktop Protocol. And for Linux, we can use SSH. For two, when does ARP podcasts occur? When the system IP and a MAC address entry is not cached. So it would then send to everyone. And, and then if if it doesn't see the system IP and the MAC address, it would then send to everyone. And so that way, uh, and you don't want a lot of broadcasts either because it does hold up a lot of your traffic. So if you want to reduce that, we want to make sure that, yes, our RP needs to be cached. And, um, you know, any kind of updates, it would then send the broadcast. For three, why does the system store ARP information as cache? It's really to reduce broadcast and, and address resolution. It reduces network utilization and address resolution time. So ARP is really going to allow us to reduce the amount of traffic that's happening in our network. And it's also going to allow us to save time and so it's a it's a good way to really implement efficiency in how we would see for our traffic flow um, now the lifetime of ARP cache entries in windows system would then be initial lifetime is two minutes and it would then need to be used within the two minutes it can live up to it can be stored in cache for about 10 minutes um, and then after that, it would go stale if it's not being reused. So here you would see that the default is 120 seconds in the, in the notes and also in the assignment. So you want to say two minutes. But um, you would then, you would then, you can actually set this, however, but that's the default. The difference between ROP and ARP. In for number five is that RARP translate MAC address to IP and ARP ARP translate IP to MAC address. So we would see RARP being used for diskless system like thin client. And so that will what well, that is what you would you would normally see. For six, what commands should you use to remove an, an assigned IP address from the system that's obtaining a new IP address? Uh, from the DHCP. So if you want to get rid of the IP address, you can then use ipconfig slash release that allows you to remove the IP address. And then you can do ipconfig slash renew. And this is Windows system that allows you to obtain a new IP address from the server. So TCP IP command is following that. And this goes into ipconfig. And for Linux, um, if you install net tools, you would have IF config command capability. But um, net tools is being phased out. So you can use IP space address as a command. And here it goes into how you can obtain the complete information by, of your IP configuration using slash all. To clear out the information, we can do a release. And then to update and obtain a new address, we can do renew. Now on Linux, some releases you can do DH client command, and that allows you to obtain or renew the IP address on the Linux side. Um, for DNS, DNS is used to resolve um, to resolve your fully qualified domain name to IP address. So what you see is Google.com would then because the server uses IP, Google.com would then be resolved by DNS and tie that fully qualified name to an IP address. Um, now, once in a while when you troubleshoot, you need to clear 
the stored resolution of DNS in the system by doing a flush. So we can do a flush DNS with ipconfig, or if we want to display the DNS, we can do ipconfig slash display DNS. And make sure that we know these commands when you are taking Network Plus. It's important because it's going to ask you quite a few Windows-based command questions because many companies use Microsoft systems. Um, another command that you would see is going to be ping. And ping stands for Packet Internet Groper. And this allows us to check system physical connection, um, as we talked about at the beginning. So we would then use it to troubleshoot and verify that that system is connected. Now, ping uses ICMP, which stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. There are, there are other tools that uses ICMP. However, basically, in Windows, it sends four packets to the destination, which is the IP address that you specify after the ping command. Um, and then it's waiting for the echo reply from the target system. Now, if there's no reply, it would show that there's it's unreachable. And um, it would show that in the output, the result statistic. Now, there are different options that you can use with ping. You can append. Um, you can have a certain packet. Um, you can have a certain parameter in the size of the ping packet. So we can definitely change up the actual ping packet by specifying the switches or the options with the command itself. Now the maximum packet length is could be up to 65,500 bytes, but we don't need to send that large of a packet. Um, However, you can also specify the number of packets you want to send. Now, in Linux, when you're simply doing a ping and an IP address, it continues to ping until you stop it. Um, or you can specify a count with a dash C for most of the Debian release. The same thing with Windows in that you can specify the number of packets that you want to send, and that allows it to really... Uh, set it up for you know a certain type of communication we can also set up the time where in that we want to send it for a certain period of time so this would let us really check how that target system is communicating with the source system now you can do ping version 4 or version 6 and so with the version 4 that would just be ipv4 with the version 6, that will be IPv6. Now, in Linux, if you want to ping version 6 IP, you would use ping 6 instead of ping 6 like Windows. So they look very similar. So let's go back to our questions. We can um, go through and take a look at some of the next few questions that would be related to command. For number 7, it asks you what command is used to renew IP address in the Linux. You can use DH client. And then for question A, it asks you which command do you use to view DNS, resolve, or cache in Windows PC? We would say ipconfig space slash display C DNS. This allows you to view cache DNS information. And um, on the second command, which is ipconfig space slash flush DNS, that allows us to clear the cache information for the DNS resolution. Now for nine, it asks you which protocol is used to ping utility to verify connection to the host. And that will be your ICMP, which stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. And we would see echo request and echo reply. So when you scan Wireshark or you use network monitoring tools, you would see these type of traffic coming through in the case that you would ping a system. Number 10, it asks you what command would, with optional switch is used to resolve IP to a host name, and we would do a ping-a.
that will be option A. So we can do that with an IP address or a host name following that. For 11, provide the appropriate answers for the following command. A, ping dash n 10 127.0.0.1. How many packets will be sent? So here you would see that the number of packets we would specify there that will be 10. Now on B, we would do a ping with the option L, and this is the value. So then the length of the packets that's sent to the host is shown here, which is 128. If this is not part of the address, that will be the length, which is the byte size. That's the length of the packet. So if you want to increase a packet length, you can change up the value following the dash and L options. And then after that, we would put in the target IP. Then C, when we do a ping dash T and an IP address, this allows us to ping until it's terminated. So the T here is it's we're going to ping until it stops. And that is the normal ping that you see in Linux system unless you do options and count um, or on the number of packets. Um, ping dash K is going to allow us to exclude the host IP from the routed list. So it would not store this IP into the routed list. So then that's what you give you a little bit of practice in how you would use the ping command, which is commonly used in network troubleshooting. Now for 12, it asks you which option is used to ping version 6 addresses in Windows and Linux system. So ping-6 is for Windows PC and ping-6 together is for Linux, most releases. For 13, um, it asks you when you are when you are using ping and receiving reply timeout message and then you try to add timeout value with the dash w option and the host system is returning reply what could be wrong with the network so in this case the packet is arriving and it's timing out after four seconds so that means that we do have latency or bandwidth problem in the network that means that we have to find ways to have better throughput. And that could be that we are, you know, maybe having a lot of bottleneck at all, all the system coming to one spot. Um, so we can look into using load balancing and then implement um, cable connections and extend our network so that way it's not going to have slow or latency issue. For 14, it says what type of ICMP message is used for echo request and echo reply. And echo request uses what's known as the ICMP8 and echo reply uses ICMP0. So request is going to do 8 and reply is going to be 0. Now, um, if you look into your notes going further after ping V4 and 6, it goes into ICMP uses. And here um, on page four and five, it talks about type A, which is where it would use that for the echo request. And the reply is type zero. So another command that you would see would be HPing2. And instead of using ICMP, HPing2 uses TCP. And this allows us to craft packets to whichever port. Um, and you can refer to hping.org for more information. So when is this really being used? Um, when you're testing firewall, when you port scanning, um, when you're testing network, when you are looking at fragmentations or looking at trace route in an advanced way. So there are many uses for HPing2, but uh, the common thing that you see that's being used for is HPing2 being used for packet crafting. 
and that can be used for testing purposes or attacking purposes so keep in mind that hbean can be used for that reason um, another command that we have used in the past also you see in this chapter is trace route and trace route can be trace rt or trace route in linux as it would be spelled out and we can add the option to it to um, extend the capability of that command such as using dash d or option d to uh, if you don't want to show a certain host name you can exclude a certain host name and the resolve name that way you can also specify the number of routers or hops can be displayed um, by using dash h to look at a certain number of hops so normally you would see that um, it is only going to track 30 and under however uh, you can specify if you want to know more about some of the routers that is involved in passing your packets. Traceroute also support version 4 and version 6 by using dash 4 and dash 6 in the Windows environment. And so if you're looking for Traceroute with just IP version 6, you would then be using the dash 6. And in Linux, we would then use trace route six with no dash between the command and six, um, as it would spell out on page six. In earlier, we mentioned netstat is uh, is a command that is used to pull statistics for your TCP/IP connections. Um, it really shows the three-way handshake for TCP. And it also lists protocol type, protocol type, addresses, ports, and so on. So if you want to know the detail about a certain uh, type of network, we would then be able to use netstat and netstat list. So you can use option with netstat, and I can include the netstat parameter table there. So you can see, um, such as using dash n, shows you the address port numbers that would be in number numerical value um, or dash O would be you providing your process ID. Now in our assignments, um, it asks you about it asks you about the command that will be used to send custom packets for hosts using TCP for 15, that will be HP2. For 16, if you are determining the number of networks or routers between the source and the destination system, what utility you would use, you can use trace route or trace RT in Windows and trace route in Linux. That's what would spell out trace route together as one word. For 17, if you want to speed up the trace and you don't want to display host names, what command would you use? You would use trace rt d. This would remove or not add the host name to the route list. Um, for 18, what is the command for tracing www.google.com over maximum of 20 hops? We would then use trace rt h 20 and then the URL or the IP address following that. For 19, what is the command to trace www.microsoft.com using server's IP version 4 address? That will be trace rt 4 and then the URL or the IP address, so www.microsoft.com. For 20, it asks you for the information, what information is provided by NetSAC command. And it's going to give you protocol type, local address, port information, remote address, port information of that, and the current connection state. For 21, what command is used to display the system NIC statistic? So you can use netstat with the dash S to obtain the statistic. Just remember S stands for statistics. So we would say for the system network interface card. 22, what command is used to display the system UDP connection? That will be netstat-p. 
UDP. For 23, how do you run Telnet in Windows PC? We would open up Command Prompt and then we would run Command Telnet.exe. And that is going to give us the Telnet executable. So you can run any executable in Command Prompt by using the calling it by just having the application with the .exe extension. And Telnet uses port 23, and Telnet again is not secure. Um, recommended that we would use other type of services. Um, however, it is available if you want to explore it. Now we normally disable Telnet in a network environment. However, you know if it's needed, you can also use Telnet to configure old routers. Uh, to connect to old routers and be able to configure that and so on. So Telnet information is on page in uh, six, and here you would see information about Telnet and how that's used to connect to the remote machine using port 23. And you would use Telnet with an IP like this. FTP file transfer protocol is used to um, access the service for file downloading and uploading um, from a certain type of server. So you would have FTP servers that provide that type of service. So we would use port 20 on TCP for, for transfer and port 21 for the control. So it uses two ports. Keep in mind that Network Plus might ask you this. So make sure that we know that port 20 and 21 is used for FTP. Like Telnet, we would have a server-based type of program. Um, you can use FTP in using Linux, Windows, or even older Unix. Um, and now the file format that it transfers is going to be text and binary. And text is in ASCII um, format. And then your binary files can be used for like OS or executable, which is non-ASCII-based. Uh, type of file. So FTP um, would we would use FTP command followed by the IP address or the fully qualified domain name such as www.mozilla.org. Then it would prompt the user to log in, and once the user logs in, it's going to then be able to provide the type of service. Some FTP site does offer anonymous login depending on the support behind that um, but likely that you can create the, the user uh, account or it would be managed by the actual administration of the server itself for that user to be able to access this content. So we have um, different options with FTP like the other command like such as dash L which is switch L allows you to turn off the interactive prompting or dash A, which allows us to automatically log in to the anonymous account. Remember, dash A stands for anonymous. And then, um, so you can implement different type of options with FTP. So then uh, for 2024, we would say that the type of port that's used for Telnet is port 23. Port 25, two modes that we can use FTP transfer is going to be ASCII and binary. Um, ASC, text, I'm sorry, text is going to be ASCII and then binary is for executable and non ASCII file. For FTP server, we would use the command FTP and the server IP or the URL. A fully qualified domain name. So that's how we're able to use that in command line. Um, for 27, it asks you to list the FTP command for the following criteria. A, we are going to automatically log in to the anonymous account. We would then use FTP-A. And then for B, to disable automatically log in, we would use FTP-N. So check out the options 
that you see in the notes and it should tell you what type there. Now, we know that we can also use TFTP and the type of servers that we would use TFTP with are going to be the ones that can store router configurations such as Cisco Network OS, Sys, uh, router configurations, ISO, which is for Cisco OS, and also your device configuration. So TFTP servers are used for that. So coming back to the notes, we would see the information for TFTP listed on page A. And here um, it talks about how TFTP is different than, TF and than FTP in that TFTP uses UDP connectionless transport instead of TCP, where FTP uses TCP. Now TFTP uses UDP port 69 and it doesn't really give any kind of confirmation if there's an error in connection because it's connectionless. <clears throat> so in the case where if the system is not having a connection to the TFTP, it doesn't confirm or provide any kind of message about the error for the TFTP. Compared to the regular FTP server, if there's an error in connection, it would then notify the source system saying that it doesn't have the connection with that because it's using TCP. Um, TFTP handles access and file permissions uh, by imposing restraints within the, the host OS itself. So in the case here, it shows you the example in that, let's say that we implement the file permission to access the, a certain information about Cisco routers. We can deploy that through TFTP. Um, and TFTP is mainly used for device configuration information backup um, or storing that along with your um, router and switches such as Cisco um, ISO images. And TFTP uses what's called the pre-boot execution environment, which is their PXE. This is like a mini OS from the network server that runs locally. It's used to backup device configuration. Um, to a server. For DNS, um, DNS resolution uh, is important as we touched on that earlier when we talked about IP config command with the DNS flush and display DNS uh, option. Now, DNS is used to resolve IP address to the fully qualified name or vice versa. Make sure that we know the IP config and the options that use for displaying and flush DNS. We can also use NS lookup, and this allows us to verify DNS name resolution from a certain server. So if you're not quite sure which server is providing the name resolution, then you can do NS lookup and it will provide you with the DNS server information, such as its name then we can operate it in two modes. One is going to be interactive and the second is non-interactive. The interactive mode allows you to use the NS lookup command and in command prompt or in command line. Um, it allows you to use it in a way where you can have multiple information that you can query. It will also allow you to look at the state and it's going to keep prompting you the command. Now on the non-interactive mode, you can type NS lookup and then it would not allow you to interact with the command prompt. It would only show you the information. And so what you would see is most likely when you use the NS lookup, if you're trying to acquire more information, you would use the interactive mode. Dict command is used in Linux system. This allows us to obtain information about your DNS, very much like NS lookup. Um, and also it gives you IP to fully qualified domain name. It also allows you to add in short 
ask the key term for the option. So you would do a plus sign in short. That gives you the summarized version of the result. So on page 10, gives you the table of what type of options you can use with, um, with dig. And dig is very commonly used in the Linux environment. Other commands we would see is hostname and host. So hostname gives you the computer name. Um, and host is going to be, you can use dig or nslookup using host. So if you want to find out more about mail servers and other type of servers, you can use host. MTR is just a diagnostic, diagnostic program that's available in Linux. It uses trace route and ping feature. Um, so it is a glorified trace route tool. Now you can simply in command line in Linux and terminal, you can type in MTR and then specify the destination by IP. Um, then it will be able to basically trace route, uh, follow the path to that destination system. We will talk more about the route command, but we would then look into ARPing. Um, now, ARPing is a way that we can use Linux utility to combine ping command and ARP. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna send ping messages, and it's gonna give you the MAC address of the IP address that you are pinging. So you can have two. Uh, you can combine those to really get see more detail about the MAC and the IP while you ping. And so path ping is important as well, where we can be able to ping to get the details of the path of two hosts. Um, and it's going to give you statistic like ping. And it's going to take a, a, a short period where it's going to take a sample of that and provide you the end to end information between the hosts. Now, to fix some of the network issues, these are some of the tasks that you should check. Uh, we should check TCP IP configuration. We should ping loopback address. We should ping local IP address. We should clear our cache table. We would verify default gateway. And we should also troubleshoot. Uh, we would trace the route. And then we would check the ports. Now, in the case where you have name resolution problem, you should check your DNS by doing ipconfig slash display DNS or nslookup. We can also check wins and also the host files on DNS and LMS host files. We can look at the type of broadcast that's being used or sent, and then we can check your NetBIOS cache. So those are some of the tips for your DNS troubleshooting. Now, for the rest of the questions, we can say that for 29, uh, the type of command used to query DNS server for specific type of records you would use and can be used for troubleshooting. You can use NSLOOKUP. And remember, it has two types of modes, interactive and non-interactive. For 30, the command that you use to gather summarize information of the IP and the FQDN would be dig. And we can say dig www.ebay.com space plus short. That would give you the summarized version of the output or the result. And then for 31, the utility uh, for A, that will be host because it's looking at specific type of servers on the network like email servers. B, when you need to send multiple ping messages to each router between the source and the destination, you can use MTR, which is very close to trace route. C, to manage route table, we would use route. For 32, what should you do to troubleshoot name resolution problems in the network? We need to check local name of the system. We would need to gather DNS information by using display DNS or NSLOOKUP. We can need to gather WINS information, host file, and LM, LMS, LM host files information. Um, 
then we need to look at which system is issuing the broadcast and we need to check NetBIOS cache. And this concludes my Unit 6, Chapter 6 lecture for CIS 48. Thank you for watching the video.